It is interesting that whenever we are tested and afflicted with disease, physical disease, we do our best to treat it. We rush to the doctor, we take medicine, we jump from one specialist to the other until we make sure that that thing that ails us is gone. And we never tire trying to find a solution for it until we find that solution. But subhanAllah, the greater diseases that infect us and plague us are not the diseases of the body, though they are testing. But they are the diseases of the self and the, cell and the soul and the heart. And what is ironic about it is that though they are more severe, more serious in this life and in the next, we don't seek treatment. We don't feel that they're serious enough. We let them torment them, torment us and wreak havoc on our lives and our families and our communities and indeed the entire ummah without seeking a medicine, consulting a specialist or seeking a solution. And today's khutbah, I want to talk about one of those diseases that in fact I want to say almost if not every human heart. At least as we're living today, there is no single human being, Muslim or non-Muslim, who escapes from this disease. And that disease is the disease of hasad. I don't want to talk about hasad in terms of how you protect yourself from envy and what you do and what you read. I want to talk about hasad as a sickness that you and me allow to fester in our hearts, to take iman out of it, to cause so much harm as you will see, that in fact ultimately it negates iman. It's a disaster when you let it reside and grow in your heart. It's a disaster for your religion, disaster for your social relationship, it's a communal disaster, and it's an ummah disaster. Hasad is not something new. You must have felt it. And it's not new because when you go to the book of Allah Azza wa Jal, and you go to the sunnah of His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you find them abundantly talking about it. When you go back to the early beginnings of humanity, when Iblis, a shaitan, was noticing the creation, the yet to be formed, fully formed human being, he sensed hasad inside of him. And he declared, as he was circling Adam, and Adam yet did not have a soul in him, لَإِن سُلِّطَ عَلَيَّ لَأَعْصِيَنَّهُ وَلَإِن سُلِّطُ عَلَيْهِ لَأُهْلِكَنَّهُ If he will be given power over me, I'm going to disobey him. And if I'm going to be given power over him, I'm going to destroy him. He had felt that there is a, this new special creation is going to challenge his position. And I want you to see what Hasad did to the shaitan. He was worshipping with whom? With the malaika. With the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was in a station and a position none of us has reached. He has knowledge that none of us has. He saw things that none of us has seen. He was so close to Allah azza wa jal. Yet when he allowed that Hasad inside of him and it's coupled with kibr. When he allowed that Hasan inside of him to ruin his relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal, he objected and he disobeyed a direct command from Allah Azza wa Jal. A direct command. And he got himself ejected from Jannah and damned. And when Allah, and I want you to see the extent of that Hasad, how pernicious, how cancerous it is, how blinding it is. That when Allah Azza wa Jal still, he had that opportunity to seek forgiveness. To say, Ya Allah, allow me another chance. Allow me, allow me to be forgiven and to be admitted again into the company of the righteous. When he had the chance to ask Allah Azza wa Jal. What did he ask Allah? He asked Allah Azza wa Jal for delayment, for, to be delayed. So that he will be... The cause for the destruction of this human and all of his family, all of his progeny, like he felt he was destroyed because of them. Why? 
Because he was saying, he promised Allah, as you have misguided me, I'm going to destroy them. That's an instance where Hasad destroyed this being. And when you move to another scene, it's not the scene that took place in the upper realms, but now on the face of this earth, the two children of Adam, alayhi salam, when they made an offering, you want to know why there is crime, why there is mischief, why, why is there so many sins on the face of the... You want to know how the first major one started. When Allah says, فَتُقُبِّلَ مِنْ أَحَدِهِمَا وَلَمْ يُتَقَبَّلْ مِنَ الْآخَرِ I want you here to relate this to yourself. When you find at times that you do your best, or maybe it's really not your best, but then someone else gets what you wanted. It's a job, it's a woman that you wanted to marry, a man that you wanted to marry, some money that you wanted to earn, whatever it is. And you find that you're competing with someone and they get what you don't get. That offering was expected, accepted from one child of Adam but not the other. Rather than him looking back at himself and saying there was something wrong in what I did and asking Allah for forgiveness and trying better, what did he say? Because there was hasad inside of him. I'm going to kill you. I am going to kill you because he was, subhanAllah, fuming with envy, fuming with hatred. That is what hasad is. You see someone else possessing what you do not have and you wish for it to go away. That's an internal feeling. And it often translates, if you do not suppress it, if you do not treat it, into statements and actions where you actually try to remove that ni'mah from someone else. You try to take it away from them. And he tried to eliminate that ni'mah by killing him. And the Prophet ﷺ told us, first in the Quran Allah tells us that he regretted that action. And that he became among the losers. And then Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that's the consequence of hasad. And following your desire, he said that every murder that takes place on the face of this earth, unjust killing, the child of Adam will carry part of that burden and part of that sin, because he's the first person who introduced this sin on the face of this earth. He comes on the day of judgment with billions and upon billions of souls being killed unjustly. And he is partly responsible. And the reason? Hasad. That's the destruction of Hasad. Move centuries and millennia forward. And Allah tells us that the people of the book, when they received Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, they rejected his message because of Hasad. أَمْ يَحْسُدُونَ النَّاسَ عَلَى مَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِ Allah is saying, are they envious of the favor that Allah had bestowed upon some people, upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba? It's because he came from them and not us. He was an Arab. He spoke this, but not from our own. We'll never accept him. In fact, they tried to take people, dissuade them from accepting Islam. وَدَّ كَثِيرٌ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ لَوْ يَرُدُّونَكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِكُمْ كُفَّارَ حَسَدًا They wish the, to remove you from Iman, to take you from Iman to disbelief. Why? Hasada. Out of envy. They look at what you have, your favors, and rather than say we can be partners in this and let us accept Iman, what do they say to themselves? This is what the envious person does. Rather than go back to Allah Azza wa Jalla and say, Yes, Ya Allah, you've given what you've given for a reason, for a wisdom. And I don't have it also for a reason and a wisdom. But your gates are always open. Go back to yourself. Accuse it. Purify it. Ask for forgiveness. And then seek from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Rather than them doing this, they release their venom. Like a snake, they release their venom on the one that they envy and they try to kill him and destroy him. That's the hasad. You want to understand why hasad is such a problem. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, لا يجتمع الإيمان والحسد في قلب مؤمن أو كما قال. In an authentic hadith, he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
Iman and Hasad do not unite together in the heart of a mu'min. It doesn't happen. That is, if you have a lot of Hasad, then you understand that your Iman is very weak. And if your Iman is strong, it eliminates Hasad from the heart. You want to know why? Hasad is built on and some assumptions. And there are four things, more or less, wallahu a'lam, that fuel hasad. And if you understand them, you'll understand why I am, I and you are envious. And then you'll understand how to treat it. Hasad, first of all, is built on greed. Tama. You love this world and I love this world so much. Because hasad is not or does not belong to the akhirah, to the realm of the akhirah. When you look at someone who has things that belong to the Akhirah, you really do not envy them. You have ghibta. Ghibta is that you admire what they have and you wish for it without elimination of that ni'mah. You wish them to continue to enjoy the Quran, to, enjoy, to continue to enjoy giving sadaqah. You see that Allah has favored them and you love that for them. And you hope that you will have this for yourself. That's ghibta. So it does not belong to the realm of the Akhirah. Hasad comes because of the dunya. Greed, so much love for the dunya. And because it is built on competition, dunya is built on competition and limited resources. If he has it, I don't. If he's doing well, I am not. So then because of that greed, I envy him when he has a bigger house than mine. I envy him when he has better children or they're doing well at school and my children are not. When he's been able to achieve so much in his professional life, and I haven't. When he has a newer car, and I don't. When he has a newer bag, a more expensive bag, and I don't. When you look at something that they have, you immediately become envious of it. You hate that they have something superior to you, and it's almost exclusively related to the dunya. If you rather focus yourself on the akhirah, and you take your attention away from the dunya, your envy will go away. Your envy will be eliminated by the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. And here there is something interesting. Allah Azza wa Jal and His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do not want you to compete in this dunya and for its sake. They want you to compete for the akhirah and for its sake. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, وَفِي ذَٰلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ In that. In the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa and His pleasure, let those who want to compete, compete. Let them compete for them something that matters, even when they want to achieve something in this life. They don't want to achieve it because of their own selves, They're, because it's going to enhance them. Let them achieve it because it's going to please Allah Azza wa when they meet it. That's the right type of competition. Because Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also says in a clear, authentic hadith, وَلَا تَنَافَسُوا Do not compete. Do not compete with each other, meaning you see that he has something from the dunya and your brain, brain is occupied now, I have, some, I have something more expensive, bigger, better than what he or she has. Do not compete for the dunya, compete for the akhirah. Divert your attention to it. And if, if you find someone competing with you, and sometimes, subhanAllah, we're plagued by those who want to compete with us, not for anything good, but for the sake of the dunya. I have something better than you, bigger than you. It says, divert your attention to the akhirah. Compete with them, but not for the dunya. You have a bigger home, I, wallahi, want my bigger home to be there. You have better food, I, wallahi, want my better food to be there. Spend for where things will last. Now will they will be eviscerated and they will evaporate. So it's built on greed. And always remember that for the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal, all of what you see weighs less than the wing of a mosquito. So if you eliminate greed from your heart, there will be no reason for hasad. Wallahu a'lam. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fastaghfiru. Alhamdulillah, hamdan kathiran, tayyiban, mubarakan fi. 
wa usalli wa usallimu ala rasulihi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew very well and he noted to people the effect of that greed on them. He asked once Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiyallahu anhu, how will you be, talking to the Sahaba, how will you be when Allah Azza wa Jal opens Persia and Byzantia to you? The Persian and the Byzantium kingdom is going to be open to you. How will you be then? Then Abdul Rahman ibn Awf said, we will be as Allah and his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam command us in love. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, awaghayra thalik. Awaghayra, are you going to be different than that? Tatanafasuha. He said, are you going to be different than that? You're going to be collecting it, then competing with each other because of it. That's the dunya. And then you're going to be hating each other. And then they will start boycotting each other. There is baghda and there is tadabur. Hasad leads to it. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in another hadith, I want you to understand, subhanAllah, the extent of that disease which goes untreated. Sometimes we don't even detect it, we feel it, but we don't even, we're not conscious of it. And the Prophet ﷺ called it Al-Haliqah, the eliminator of religion. He said, Dabba ilaykum da'ul umami min qablikum. al hasadu wal baghda the disease of the nations before you is infecting you. Hasad, envy, and hatred. It is the shaver. It does not shave hair. It shaves religion. It eliminates it completely. When you hate other people because of what you have, there's nothing left. There is no bond between you and them. Then what you will do is that you will try to do your best to take away that ni'mah from them. Let's go back to the reasons of why hasad is there. Hasad is also there because you understand the reality of this life. And we also misunderstand Allah's decrees. If you believe that Allah gives for a reason and denies for a reason, then you'll never be envious by the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. As some of the Salaf have said, Ya Abdullah, O slave of Allah, why are you envious? If Allah has given something good to someone to honor him, are you going to stand in the face of Allah's honor? Do you think that that person does not deserve it? And Allah has decided that they deserve it. Or if He has given that to a person as a test, and this test is going to take them to hellfire, are you wishing for the same thing for yourself? Because it's one of two things. And maybe the thing that you want and people have and you don't, if Allah were to give it to you, you're not going to be thankful. And it's going to be a disaster for yourself and for your family. Are you wishing for your own illness and disease? Are you wishing for your own piece of hellfire? Why are you envious? Rather, when you see something that people have and you don't, as Allah says, He says, do not wish what Allah had, put, had favored some over others. Allah, dist Allah distributes this according to a reason. There's wisdom. Incredible wisdom behind it. So don't accuse Allah in His distribution. If you want Allah, His gates are always open. And know that He will give you what is best for you. The other thing is that we, subhanAllah, and this is human, we evaluate ourselves and our worth based on what we have. If I have a better degree, if I have more money, if I have better children, and if I, have, if I own better things, then I feel better about myself. And if this other person has more, I feel worse about myself. So envy tries to do what? Eliminate that competition. Make me again feel best about myself by finding the worst about this other person. And if I cannot find the worst, if I cannot spread the worst, I'll try to take that ni'mah away from him. Because if he's doing worse, I by comparison am better. But then, Ya Abdullah, slave of Allah, understand. That Allah Azza wa on the Day of Judgment is not going to classify you based on how much you have in this life. All of these categories are meaningless. It doesn't matter how famous you are. 
It doesn't matter how many followers or responses you get on social media. It doesn't matter how many likes you get. It does not matter how much money you have. It does not matter how incredibly well you're doing in this world or how incredibly well your children are doing or how beautiful or handsome your husband or wife are. It doesn't all of these things. When you pass away and you meet Allah Azza wa none of these things matter. The only thing that matters is the taqwa of Allah Azza wa Jal. So you have to look at all of these things as illusions, as distractions. You're not better because you own better. You're not better because you achieve better. You're better if you use these things to please Allah Azza wa Jal. And you are actually worse if these things take you away from Him. Why do you compare yourself to others? Do not compare yourself to others. And here I want to really share some piece of advice with people. Especially those who use social media extensively. I'm asking you by Allah Azza wa Jal, do not post your happiest moments on social media. The best meal that you're having, the best wedding that you're having, the latest trip that you have. There are people on this earth who are going to see this and their heart is going to break because they don't have what you have. The least that is going to happen is you're going to break their heart. You're going to make their uh, day worse. And the worst thing that's going to happen and you should be aware of it, that some of those eyes are going to look at what you have and they're going to envy you and you're going to lose it. It's up to you. You're doing two incredibly bad things. One, you're bringing envy to yourself and you're harming your brother and your sister. Say, share it with loved ones. Share it with ones that are close to you. Not with everybody. Not with those who do not have. We need some consideration and some compassion. And if you find that your exposure to social media is making you more miserable and studies have shown that it's actually making humanity more miserable, stay away from it. Stay away from it. The more that you're on, on, on Facebook, on Twitter, the more that you see what other people have, and it's all fake, but how much people have, the more miserable you are. See it. Test it. So stop that. Stop that. The last thing is that the way that you change your situation is to ask Allah Azza wa from His favor. Envying someone else is a sin. It's a major sin. It's a major sin. It doesn't change anything. In fact, it harms you more than it harms other people. You're the first victim of your own envy. You're the person who's hurting the most mentally, psychologically, emotionally. You're like on a bed of fire. You can't sleep well. You can't be happy because you always see other people having what you don't have. Why are you tormenting yourself? Rather, let go of all of this and know that your real life is in the hereafter. And if you want something, and I'm going to tell you inshallah about the treatment of hasad. But before that, I want to share with you a brief story. A brief story where, subhanAllah, the end of it is a nice proverb. لِلَّهِ دَرُّ الْحَسَدِ مَا أَعْدَلَهِ بَدَأَ بِصَحِبِهِ فَقَتَلَهِ how incredibly just envy is. It begins with the envier and it kills him. There's a story that people share where there was this king and he had this close advisor, very close to the king. And that advisor would repeat to the king one golden piece of advice. Ahsin ila man ahsana ilayk. Be nice, be gracious to those who are gracious towards you and let go of those who insult you and harm you because you will be sufficed their harm and their wrongdoing. A person around the king was so envious of this person that he decided to plot against him. So what he wanted to do here, he went to the king and he told him, so and so your close advisor thinks that you have chronic bad breath and he's telling people that. He says, how do I know that what you're telling me is true? He says, ask him for a, a counsel, a private counsel. Whisper something in his ear, you'll find that he's covering his nose and mouth. So he said, I'll do this. Then before that, that person invited that counselor to a lunch and he put so much garlic and onions in it. Then in the afternoon, the king called this advisor. And of course, when he came close to him and he wanted to talk to him, he smelled of onion and garlic, so he covered his nose and his mouth, so that the king doesn't smell it. The king was then convinced, prematurely convinced, that he was telling the truth and that he was spreading these rumors about him. So he wrote to him a letter and he sealed it and he says, take this letter to so and so. And typically, that is a letter that has in it gifts, money. So he was taking this to its destination. Then that envier saw him coming out. He said, what do you have in your hand? He says, I have a gift from the king. He says, please give it to me. Please give it to me. He says, fine, take it. Generous. He said, take it. He takes it to its destination. They open it. What's written in it? 
the carrier of this letter, if you find him, arrest him and execute him. He says, pleading with them, stop, it's not me, it's meant for someone else, please. He says, no. He says, just going back and ask the king. He said, you want us to question the king? We're going to execute whatever he wants. Chopped his head. And they took back the body to the king. And they're bringing in the body. And the counselor, the advisor is walking, healthy, sound. The king looks at it and he says, what is this? Come, tell me what happened. He says, as I was exiting, he asked me for this, so I gave it to him. I don't know what's in it. He said, he told me this and that about you. They're spreading these rumors about me. And he said, and he fed me this and this before I met you. He said, come back. You're really my advisor and my counselor. And then the end of it, he said, how incredibly just envy is. It begins with the envier and it destroys him and kills them. It will destroy you if you allow it to destroy you. But you can stop it. And you can stop it insha'Allah. That's the last thing I want to say. You will stop it insha'Allah by dua. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that if you see something and you admire it, فَلْيُبَرِّكْ عَلَيْهِ Ask for barakah for it. That will protect that thing from envy. You're not going to envy it. But also there is in it a great wisdom. That is, instead of you wishing that that ni'mah will be eliminated, change your attitude. Ya Allah, give him more of it and bless it. Better children, more money if it's good for him. A bigger house if it's good for him. A better position if it's good for him. And you will feel better. Especially if you remember that as you are making this dua, Allah will put an angel who is after every supplication. He will say, and you too. And you too. And you too. So you'll keep making dua for him and her. Because the angel is making dua for you. He is not losing anything and you're gaining everything. That's the, that's the medicine for envy. And at least, at least, if you feel it inside your heart, don't say anything and don't do anything with it. Uqdum alayhi, as Al-Hasan al-Basri said. Uqdum alayhi, keep it inside. Don't say anything to attack this person. Don't do anything to attack that person. And then treat it on the inside. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal, the most merciful, the most high, to eliminate envy from our hearts. And to eliminate the diseases, all the diseases of the hearts. And to make us aware of them. And to help us to cure our hearts. And to fill them with Iman, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Ya Allah, make us of those who purify their hearts. And purify their bodies. Ya Allah, purify the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the diseases of the heart. Purify our communities and our families from the diseases of the heart, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Most make us of those who seek your forgiveness. And seek what you love. And who run away from what you hate, Ya Arham ar -Rahimeen. Ya Allah, we ask you for the best in this life and in the hereafter. And we seek your protection from the worst that is in this life and in the hereafter. Inshallah, I just want to remind you before we finish, that as the brothers spoke previously, and he said that the masjid is so close, alhamdulillah, to paying its final installment for this year to settle the debt or what has remained from the price of the masjid. And that the simple donation of a hundred dollars coming from every one of us or more bi'ithnillah if Allah Azza wa had blessed you will insha'Allah secure that last installment. So subhanAllah whenever you find this opportunity when a door of good opens and you don't even know when these things are going to close and you will not be able to do it again for personal or for other reasons. Whenever a door of good opens enter it. Because Allah Azza wa has opened it for you for a reason and He's inviting you. So don't decline the invitation of Allah Azza wa Whatever you can give, Allah will best bless you for it. I will continue with dua. Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al nar. Allahumma na nasaluka al jannata wa ma qarraba ilayha min qawlin wa amal. Wa na'udhu bika min al nari wa ma qarraba ilayha min qawlin wa amal. Wa nasaluka min khayri ma sa'alaka abduka Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa na'udhu bika min sherri ma sta'adaka minhu abduka Muhammad. صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم طهر لنا قلوبنا اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من الحسد اللهم نعوذ بك من الحسد اللهم نعوذ بك من الحسد اللهم نسألك الخير كله ونعوذ بك من الشر كله اغفر لنا ذنوبنا كلها ما علمنا منها وما لم نعلم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث أصلح لنا شأننا كله ولا تكلنا إلى أنفسنا طرفة عين وأقم الصلاة